what I began to realize was everyone was my enemy. The people, other people were my enemy. Uh, it was them. Cancel culture seems like it's everywhere. Celebrities, influencers, and even average Joes like you and me can be canceled. How do we as Christians follow truth and conviction without being canceled ourselves? We're gonna talk about all of that, and it begins right now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Live Change Podcast. My name is Chad, I'm your host here on the podcast, and I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Jason Mitchell. How you doing, pal? Doing great. I'm also joined by my co-host on the podcast, Miss Joanna Wishard. How you doing, friend? Good, doing good. I wanted to start out with this conversation by saying, like, what are some brands and some places and things that are gone? Like, what are some things that are gone that you miss? I was starting to process this. Like, I'll just I'll start. So you guys think think about some things that you miss. But one of the things that I miss is I miss bookstores. I miss borders. Do you remember borders? Yeah, I do actually. There used to be a Borders right next to an Olive Garden, and I remember th- eating. When you're, when Olive you're a college Garden. student, it's amazing. Yes, you go in and just read books for free. Oh, t- totally. Yeah. yeah, college student. Not not now. I wouldn't. No, do that, that is what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I miss bookstores. I miss I miss Blockbuster. Huh. Like, Why? You can get it now for in your home. Oh, see, th- no, sna- you no miss- nostalgia. You have no nostalgia right now. Not of a blockbuster. I oh, absolutely. It used to be a blockbuster night. Uh, it was a whole night. You went there. You got candy and popcorn, and you got a movie, and it, you would be able to choose movies. Like you got to see them all. And, yeah, I remember. I was and- never allowed to go to the new release section. <laughs> oh, really? Why? Because <laughs> those were more expensive to rent. Uh, yes. It's kind of like when, like, if you weren't allowed <laughs> oh. to go to like the one movie theater, but like. My dad always uh, took us to the one where the movie had been out for a year. Yeah. And it's like, yes. oh my gosh, this movie, it's only a buck now. Yeah, we can totally go see that one. Dude, parents are the best. <laughs> I know. Just parents are so quirky. I mean, yeah. I love parents. Like, and now that I am one, I'm the weird one. Like, I'm like, don't go over to that section. And the things you try to pull over your kids' eyes, you know, like, they, I think like they're we're going to go to the movies. Yeah. But your dad knew, oh, it's, you know, that movie had been out. Yeah. We're going to totally. go see Uncle Buck. It's been out, you know, <laughs> since 1987. We're going to go ahead and you, leave a reference to, to Uncle Buck on the, the show notes <laughs> so people will understand what the heck you're talking well, about. Well, and it's like things you're like, oh, man, when I become a parent, I'm totally letting my kids shop in the new release section or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I think, like, kids are smarter now because, like, I've tried that with my son where it's like, oh, Finn, we can't do that or whatever. And he's like, no, we totally can. Like, mm. or he'll even say things like, I heard you and dad talk about the budget. Like, I think it'll be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah. It's a dollar. I'm mom. like, dude, come uh, on. You just remind me of something that's gone that I miss. What? Because when you said that, I thought my parents didn't let me get, we, we were only allowed to order water when we went out. Mm. The very few times we went out to eat, we yes. could only dr- order water, which is, you know, what was it? I don't know. 49 cents. Oh, totally. So we only got water, and but that reminded me, majority of times we went out was at Ryan's Steakhouse. I miss Ryan's. Oh, yeah. You remember there Ryan's? There you go. I do. And, and for a lot of our, our Gen Zers that are listening and millennials that are listening, they miss things like Vine and, and stuff like that. And, you know, what are some things that, like, that went out here? Um, Toys R Us is gone. Yeah. Yeah. I miss Toys R Us. It was you so good. You know, it's good. funny. I miss MySpace. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Joanna do you still have a MySpace be, be you honest know do you want to share you, your MySpace I don't really know but it's that is there. that is like the platform that my husband and I started talking on oh. like when we were in high school and so anyway it's like oh man like MySpace huh. isn't a thing anymore wait you met Kevin on MySpace yeah oh my goodness really did you, you were met, online we, dating no you were online dating no no before. no well I don't know we went to the same high school Okay. It's just like, that's where like we were brave didn't enough. Talk, didn't right, talk exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Different sets of friends. Like anyway, it was just like, yeah, he sent me a message. What, did, what was the message? <laughs> hey, gonna kill Joanna, me for Joanna girl 94. He's going to kill me for yeah. telling you guys this. Oh, I want to hear it. I am so excited. The whole message. Okay. This was the whole, and I'm not making this up. Any of you can, at Kevin Wishard, he will confirm this for you. <laughs> the whole message was, I like your hair. That was the whole message. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> The whole message. You mean start. So I start to finish. finish. Capital I like your hair. Period. Send. That was it, guys. And I that's, I went for that. Dude, that's actually 
incredibly smooth because <laughs> he left it so mysterious that you probably were like, what? Totally. I've, there is a, and like AIM. what are you talking about? So then, but he got you engaged. Yes. So then like we started talking on instant messenger. <laughs> That's good. Right. And cause like, even then, like it wasn't like you were calling on the phone all the time. You know what I mean? Like instant messenger was like the new thing. And I remember he was, I was like, Hey, I got to go. It was dial up. Like, let's talk about something else that's not mm -hmm. around anymore. Yeah. And we couldn't just be on the computer all the time. So I like vividly remember like my mom would be like, Hey, you have to get off. Like I need to use the phone, you know, whatever. And so Kevin was just like, here's my number. Just call me. We can talk. About and, I was your like, hair. and I was like, I'm not giving you my number. I'm not <laughs> calling you. He's like, yes, you will. You're going to call me. Wow, that is smooth. Yeah, I, and I, gotta, I called him. Dude. But there is a thin line between smooth and creepy. Now, like, sixteen years just, later, just say it a different way. Like he's like, "Hey, I like your hair." Yeah. <laughs> or it could be like, oh, "I like your hair." <laughs> <laughs> you ever, you ever heard that bit? Some comedian. He's like, "Anything you say <laughs> is creepy if you whisper it." <laughs> like, "Hey, I like your hair." I like your hair. Yeah, totally. like it doesn't matter. It can be the most wholesome thing, or if you whisper yeah. it, yeah. it crosses so the line. Weirder. Yeah, everything is weird yeah. when you whisper yeah. it. Oh gosh, Kevin's gonna kill me for telling I, you guys all this. That's stuff. definitely making the cut. Um, Your hair looks nice. <laughs> so here's something I just recently missed: is um, there was this place that sold sandwiches, and I loved this one chicken sandwich. Mm. Like it was so good. And, and you're going to know where I'm going with this story because it, it leads into our topic today, which is all about cancel culture. So Yeah, those two things immediately. Chicken I sandwiches them. and cancel culture. So today, uh, like as, as we talk about that, I first start with this story of like, so I loved this chicken sandwich. And I need to know more about it. What? Why did you love it? It was it was like uh, it had like a white sauce on it mm -hmm. and okay. it was like a crunchy like mayonnaise. Crunchy. It has a mayonnaise base, but no. Oh. <laughs> oh, you asked if the white sauce was mayonnaise. <laughs> so it was really good. Right. But then I come to uh, like so like it's been months and months and months and probably years and you know probably since the pandemic that I went to this place. But I went back thinking that I would you know get the same sandwich. Turns out the the restaurant is closed, and I thought oh just another casualty of the the economy and stuff, and I was sad about that. But I come to realize after I Google it. It wasn't closed. It had been canceled. And here's what happened. So apparently the person that owned the the, the restaurant had had posted something on social media that w or reposted something that wasn't all that nice. But then he was kind of picketed for a while and it, he couldn't survive any longer. And he closed the store and he closed and now I can no longer get that chicken sandwich. So it actually brings me to, to my question of the day is that we're going to talk about cancel culture because it seems like it's in the media a lot. People are being canceled. Celebrities are being canceled. You know, even kids at school are being canceled, social media, everything. So I wanted to talk today about cancel culture. So my first question is, for those of that maybe are listening that are like, what is cancel culture? What is it? How would you define cancel culture? Like, uh, how would you define it? And do you think it actually exists? Or is this a, just like the monster under the bed? So I don't know a technical definition. I mean, oh, I yeah, guess, I'm not looking for the Webster's, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess technically how I would understand cancel culture would be anytime someone is uh, like there is a concentrated effort to silence or erase someone, someone no, for lack good. of a better word, because of a differing viewpoint. Yeah, differing viewpoint, or yeah. or something they've done that is societally, you know, yeah. intolerable. Intolerable. You know? Yeah, but I guess it just depends on which side of the yeah. debate you are on. That, absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, like some people, some people actually like so. Some people get really mad about cancel culture. And that's why I think this is uh, an important thing for us to talk about as Christians is where do we fall in this world of cancel culture? Because there is some people that are very angry about cancel culture and they want to eliminate it. They, they feel like, for instance, comedians can't say anything mm -hmm. without, mm -hmm. you know, fear of being canceled. And then other people are on the other side and they would say, you're right. Comedians can't say just anything. And they view cancel culture as a consequence culture. And, and right. they view cancel culture as a rightful uh, ushering into a, a new era where 
we do have some accountability and we can't just say anything. We can't just do anything. We've got to be accountable for that. So, so out of curiosity, do you think it, it's gone unchecked? Yes. Describe. Um, I think sometimes we're just really quick to get there. Ooh, go on. I don't know. Or at least, yeah, even just the, I think one of the things I wrestle with is sometimes I see a lot of like also bandwagon cancel culture. So it's like, hey, one person or group of people or whatever have decided to cancel something or someone or whatever. Yes. And then sometimes I just can't tell, are other people just like joining? Do we really understand like what we're canceling? So yeah. I think sometimes like for me, honestly, like, yes, I see it, but sometimes I just don't even know what to really make of it or where does it start? Like, how do you get from cancel culture? Like, can you get uncanceled? Like, yeah. so yeah, I think some of the lines just seem kind of fuzzy to me for how like that, the idea keeps progressing. So yeah, like it, I do agree with you. I think, what do you, do you think social media plays into that, Joanna? Yes. And I think like where it gets interesting with social media is like you use the word consequence. Like sometimes it also doesn't always seem like there's a consequence to canceling or to jump on the bad bandwagon or to be a part of the, yeah, how it is displayed in social media. Like it's really easy to just like scroll and repost or share or double tap or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes we do that so fast. I don't even know that we always understand the implications of what we're canceling or what, the perception is, or then what does our double tap, reshare, comment, what are the implications of like joining that? Where do you think fear and shame comes in and why, what do we as Christians need to be observant of? Yeah. Well, uh, well, one of the things just real quick, I feel like as a consequence of our rush to cancel whatever ideas and people we don't agree with or don't, or say, or sometimes just mess up is it's it's actually limited at a cultural level I think in some ways it's limited our ability to think and reason and and um what's the word uh relate to each other when we have disagreements mm -hmm. yeah. so it's it's but it's at a one more fundamental level we don't you don't have to think if you just cancel someone yeah because or ask questions or get or curious get clarity. Yeah. Or seek clarity or chat, have your own viewpoint challenged or whatever. So to me, it's a really, really easy way out, uh, of, of, of having to think. And I think you're dead on right, Joanna, about oftentimes we jump on these bandwagons, um, and don't, I have no clue. Mm -hmm. Some consequences are just natural in human, human life, but it does seem like the, the, the offenses have gotten smaller and the punishments have gotten greater. Yeah. Yeah. I remember even a couple, I mean, maybe it was several months back. There was someone in kind of like the kid space um, who she like creates great content and was like really well known for the content she was creating to help like parents. But she made some decisions around um, what she was going to fund or donations she was going to make to certain places. And like the, internet space like in that like nook mm -hmm. of the internet like just we're like oh my gosh well then like I can't support you anymore like I and it's like well I don't know like her resources aren't bad yes and it's like well it's her money I maybe I don't agree with the choices or you don't agree with what she's doing but sometimes it just gets fuzzy for me because it's like do I get to tell her what to do with her money I, I mean I don't think so I don't have to agree with what she's doing, but am I going to like stop using her resources? Well, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's weird that it's like people, not mm -hmm. brands today or stores or like physical yes. places. Let's talk about we as Christians with, you know, when, when there is something or someone that has, has been canceled in the, the public sphere, especially like celebrities, for instance. So is there a, a responsibility? What does, what is the Christian's responsibility to, to not partake in things that were um, created by someone that's been canceled for maybe even good reasons. So uh, let's, let's let me give you a real world example, like um, the Cosby Show. Like I can't find the Cosby Show because Bill Cosby was mm -hmm. did some horrific things, and 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 I I now is it okay to watch the Cosby Show with my kids, or is it like do I need to? 
eliminate that, or maybe it's the Michael Jackson album Thriller. And it's like, is mm-hmm. do we just what do we do with the art when we discover that the artist is is a problem? Do we have to no longer consume it? So like the 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 videos you were talking about. Mm-hmm. So do we no longer consume those videos because we disagree with them or we've canceled them? Or what do we do? What do we do with Harvey Weinstein movies? Mm-hmm. Like, what is our responsibility as Christians? You have to make decisions. There's lines that get crossed. And with co- whenever we engage with cultural, so you're talking, movies are a cultural artifact. Just take movies. Sure. Or shows, right? Those sure. are cultural artifacts, something that was made. And you have to know, does this, I would ask the questions, does this encourage my spirit? Does this uh, lead me more towards wholeness and goodness and peace and patience and joy? Like, does it just even bring laughter into our home? I mean, all that kind of stuff, right? Or is there, does this, the, the, probably the opposite of that is oppressive. Like, does this give me a sense of heaviness, mm. darkness, oppressive? There's songs that I can't, I won't listen to because it like it takes me back to memories of when I was in a dark place, whatever. They won't do that for you. But for me, I need to be um, anti-culture on those things. That's but, really good. But, but that's why, I mean, you, mm-hmm. you've got to be careful. I think prescribing on this one, you need to be in tune with the Spirit of God and what it does in your heart and in your life. So... What, so... Give me, give me a, sp- a scriptural like. You know, is it Philippians that says, you know, like focus on these things? Like, um, mm-hmm. we're 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 really supposed yeah. to train our minds. Like, what, what whatever is, that? is good and praise. That's in Philippians too. Good honorable and, and honorable and yeah. praiseworthy and excellent and true. Yes. So we should. We really are training our minds and our or thoughts on to to what we should be. What what's good and right, and we've got to test things. I guess what I'm saying is. There's not a right or wrong, I guess. There's not a blanket answer. There's not a yes, no, yum or yuck. It's, it's, it's more tiring and more tedious than that. It's what I hear you saying is sometimes, sometimes we just have to test the spirit. I think so, and I, I guess, I mean, like, get real practical. Cosby, you know, we're showing. I don't know if we're hitting the right demographic with with this example. Bill but, Cosby, and <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, the but I know people in my life who can't watch the Cosby show anymore because of what he did. Yeah. And because they think about all the bad and that's oppressive, that's heavy to them. Mm. Cool. I mean, like I get that. Yeah. So to me, again, that's not a cancel thing. That's a, I've got to draw, I got to know where the spirit of God is leading me and how to engage these cultural pieces. And I think where it gets mixed up and like crosses that line is when like you're telling me that mm-hmm. I should cancel. Oh, that's Cuz like really so good. much of what you're saying, I mean even practically for me like I will joke like I'm a total wimp when it comes to media and movies and things that are like scary. That things that are like scary for me are probably totally fine for most people. Like mm-hmm. lots of times I'll use the word like I'm just media sensitive. Like I have to be careful what I consume cuz it's like hard for me to like move past heavy things or things that would be like thriller or, you know, psychological, that kind of stuff. But like, that's a choice that I'm making. Like that's the discernment light that I have, Mm -hmm. like because of the way I'm wired or the way that like the spirit, like, um, nudges me or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I think where it crosses the line is when it's like, Oh, well you love Jesus. You're a Christian. So you should be canceling this too. And some of that, I think like your word prescription is like a great word to use there because I think where it gets fuzzy is when we try to prescribe how other people should consume or, um, you know, be a part of. Okay. So, so where does, where does, what does God have to say about that level of judgment? Is that a level of judgment that we put on other people when we're trying to prescribe for them and... I totally have this visual of the kind of person that you're talking about. And I know, Joanna, that I've probably been that person in Mm -hmm. times where that statement of how can you, Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Like those words, like how can you blank because of blank? How can you blank as, how can you as a Christian, how can you as a pastor, how can you blank because of blank? And it is that judgment, Mm -hmm. Chase? Well, it's judgment if you believe you're better than the person 
as a result of that. That's, oh. that's I think, the definition of judgmentalism is judgmentalism is not calling out something as wrong. This, this is the part of the problem with our culture today is it's, it's no one can ever challenge anything because, see, part of what's the deeper level of this conversation is people's identities are all wrapped up in ideas now, so you can't separate the two. Mm-hmm. And so if you have an idea yep. that's different than mine, yeah. it's not an idea difference. It's a Chad difference. It's yes. a you. We've, we, 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 we've mixed all these things up so we can't have objective conversations about ideas. So now I've got to cancel you. I've got to be distant from you. As opposed to have, that's what I mean. Like, this is why we don't, we don't stretch our thinking anymore. We're never mm-hmm. around people. And that's also why it's so attractive, man, when people see others who disagree, like fiercely disagree, and yeah. they're laughing, and they're like having coffee together. And mm-hmm. that's, mag- that's a really attractive thing right now. That'll stand out in our world. Yeah. Um, and it seems, it seems as though that's becoming increasingly uncommon. And Jace, so like, again, we're all over the map here, but I really, I want to keep going because I think that's what a lot of people are going to nod their heads that are joining us here at the table. They want to know, like, how does that apply to my individual family? So Jason, a good example of what you just described is like, I, I, I know family members, even in my own family that don't talk because they have different political mm-hmm viewpoints and they hold them so heatedly mm-hmm. that they will completely unown family members they will cancel yeah. other family members and and they can't talk they can't see each other they can't and, and i know friends that have had this happen you see it on facebook it becomes very it's filled with vitriol there's no communication there's no conversation mm-hmm. And it seems like the party lines are drawn. And my question is, like, what is what is God's hope for this? What what do you, would you say to to the family that's experiencing cancel with their in their own family? And and is there a recipe to kind of remedy remedy a family that finds themselves in the throes of cancel? Because, well, yeah, let's you mean let's division, go there. Division and 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 and. Yeah, relationships have been fractured because, because of, of what you said. The and, ideological differences yeah. and the problem in our society is you can find your tribe. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you believe. Mm-hmm. You can go online and find your tribe. Yeah, and so like you have family members that normally would have to get along because hey, we're a family. We got to get along. You know, mm-hmm. like you're all I got. To all of a sudden, yeah, I don't need you. I I have my tribe. You know, some of yeah. them are in another state, but it doesn't matter. I don't need you to like me well man i don't know how deep we want to get philosophically with some of this and some of the underpinnings of how we've gotten here but one of the things one of the reasons i think we've gotten here is because we live in a culture now where what would be called expressive individualism is our highest value as a culture so that means me living out my authentic individual self is the highest value Okay, that didn't used to be the case. What used to be the case is you were shaped by a community, by a family unit, traditionally, by a community. That actually is considered oppressive today to have to, um, what's the word, bend my will or, or, or be told that I should be or uh, should be thinking a different way about something or whatever it might be, right? Like, you now, it's not that you, you're oppressing me. You're, you're, because my individuality, mm-hmm. my identity is tied up with it all. Well, my point with bringing all that up is I just wanted to explain that. So families become also a stage on which we, it's now, it's not a, uh, a family unit is not my tribe to mm-hmm. be formed by, to, who, to, to tell me who I am. Oh. Um, they are there to support my, which is an incredible burden to place on people that you got to find yourself. No wonder we're so anxious. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, um, that's the stage I think that's kind of set right now with the family stuff, which is why it gets all like so divisive. And I think then that's when we get frustrated in those, or that's when you can get frustrated in those environments where the people that are around you, you're hoping for an echo chamber yeah. and they believe something totally different than you. 
And so then it's like, that's where I feel like you get in that stalemate where it's like, I'm quick to plant my flag, but I'm really slow to move it. So like, good luck trying to get me to do so. So then I think like, that's where we just check out instead of like checking into the conversation. Like we just check out and it's like, Oh, well clearly we're just going to have to agree to disagree. And that's kind of like the end of conversation when instead like to where we even started some of our conversation, like we don't ask more questions or we don't say, Hey, tell me more about how you got there. Or Mm -hmm. like, we're just so quick to be like, Oh, well I tried. I like gave you my pitch or my, you know, Mm -hmm. I expressed who I am. And like, I didn't get that in risk. Like I didn't receive that back. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm out like, yes. Thanks, but no thanks. I think the other thing is it it comes down to the fact that either you agree with all of what I agree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Or you don't, yeah, we don't have you a don't affirm me. Yeah. yeah, you you have to you have to agree with everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This happened to a, a loved one of mine who had a dear friend for like thirty years, and then all of a sudden it became the president, the most recent presidential election, mm-hmm. and they kind of came to the table and they were both like, yeah, you know, like the presidential election, and they hit this wall where they realized they were voting for different people, and all of a sudden thirty years of friendship hit the rocks. They didn't talk. And it all because of this and the good news on the other side of it, and this is probably part of the advice we may want to get into here is about a year later, year and a half later, the decision was made by my, by my loved one, you know, something we're just not going to talk about it. Like she, she reached out, she said, we're That's kind of wise. And, and, and she's like, Hey, and she, what she did is she made this decision that the sum total of you mm-hmm. is more valuable than where we disagree. That there is much more value it's, in you than mm-hmm. than where we disagree. It's a disagreement. Yeah. You know, it's not your identity. Like that's where no. you, you, yeah, you had said that earlier too, where it's like your opinions don't have to become your identity. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I think that trips us up too. Cause then you're saying your family's like, I believe the you're saying, Hey, I believe these things you guys don't agree with me. So then all of a sudden you don't like me or you You've don't ag- rejected me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying we don't see that this the same way. Yeah. So it's become like a moral mm-hmm. thing. Like where it's like, like I can't, Maybe. I can't not disagree with you because morally I disagree with you. Mm-hmm. It's almost like it's become a religion in its own right. The things I believe are my religion. They're my, mm-hmm. you know, marching orders. Well, go, let's go back to your family question a moment ago and just even Christians and how we respond. So at the, 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 the most fundamental level, if you're a follower of Jesus, what are you called to do? You're called to, to love others as Christ himself has loved you. Bottom line, like that's at the end of the day, right? The most fundamental posture of Christians yeah. is to do for others what Christ, what God through Christ has done for us, to love others in that way. Paul refers to that as the law of Christ. John refers to it. Jesus talked about it. It is sort of the thing. All right, so now let's back up. How did Jesus love us? Jesus loved us when we were not, we didn't just disagree with God. The The New Testament says we were enemies of God. We were opposed to God. We wanted, we wanted to be our own gods. We allowed pride and selfishness and all of that to separate us from the one God who made us in his image and desires a relationship with him. And yet, while we were still sinners, Mm. God loved us and gave his life for us on the cross as a ransom. So if that's the case, what does that mean for us as Christians? It means we love the people who disagree with us, who are opposed to us, who who everyone else would consider our quote-unquote enemies ideological enemies. We love those people. I mean, we have to agree. God, Jesus doesn't agree with our sin. He meets us in our sin and changes us and gave his life for us. So uh, that's what I mean. Like the most remarkable, one of the most remarkable, it's not hard to stand out as a Christian in today's world, I don't think. Because if you just do this, that'll make you different. Like if you just love the people who who don't look, think, vote, believe like you, whatever. Yeah, that doesn't happen much anymore. No, 
And who did Jesus, I always find this fascinating. Remember when Jesus called his 12 disciples? And it's one of those parts in the Bible that you read right over. It just lists 12 names. And you read right over it. It's, at least I always do. But just stop there for a second and read the names. And it's saying something. Matthew was a Roman sympathizer, tax collector, okay? Sitting right next to him, Simon the Zealot. He was a Jewish nationalist, hated, not just hated Rome. He was a part of a terrorist organization intent on taking out Rome. Sitting next to Matthew, who was a Roman sympathizer collecting taxes for Rome. You have Peter, who was a poor fisherman sitting next to John and James, who says were sons of Zebedee. The fact that John wrote sons of Zebedee and other gospel writers means that Zebedee was probably a well-known Name, meaning they had a business, they had an enterprise. So you've got a wealthy family, probably who had means, I should say, yeah. who runs an enterprise sitting next to a peasant. You've got this wide, they look nothing like each other. Jesus like, this is who I'm going to build the kingdom with. Mm. And because you're all sitting around the table looking at me. So if our church, I want to tell our church this at some point on the weekend, if our church doesn't look like a widely divergent group of people, we're not doing what Jesus did. It's got, we've got to have Democrats and Republicans and races and people with different beliefs and values. Like that is Jesus brought them all to the table and kept them focused on him. And ask them to put all their ideas aside in some ways. Mm-hmm. Not to not not to be non thinking, but to say those are not most important. So Yeah. So and I think that's the permission, but also the challenge. I think it comes with both permission and challenge. I think it's you have permission to dis- disagree with people. You have permission to have your 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 convictions, thoughts, your convictions, your yeah. beliefs. But if we are to take what God did himself seriously which God saw past the broken, saw past while we were still sinners, he still saw that we had intrinsic value. And even people that we might disagree with, and and we think it's a moral imperative, like imperative, like it's a moral imperative, and it's it's the, the, the number one hot button that you might have, and they disagree with you on that. I think I think God's challenge to us is, in spite of that, they still have value. What would what would you say is the challenge for the person that's listening that maybe is starting to break through and starting to realize, like, you know, maybe God's challenging me? What would you have to say to them? Related to to laying aside their own... Yes. So, it, okay, I'm just going to... Like, if, if you only watch certain newscasts, if you mm-hmm. only go to certain certain uh, web pages, if you only have one view and mm-hmm. and you have isolated yourself historically from other people and other people that disagree with you and maybe even have uh, alienated yourself from others because of the, the passion of your conviction mm-hmm. and you're listening to this and you start to see some some dings and some cracks in, in, in that. I'm just kind of cu- curious what you would say to that person that's feeling that right now. I would just say, don't give up your convictions. You don't need to lay those aside. Bring your convictions, have strong convictions. But if you're a follower of Jesus, your convictions are in service or maybe they fall under and they are never to trump compassion. That's it. I mean, like, at the end of the day, you don't need to not have convictions. You just need to make sure that you never sacrifice relationships in pursuit of convictions because Jesus did not do that didn't do that. Yeah. Came after us. He came after the relationship. And man, we did not deserve that. We did not deserve that. Uh yeah. So uh keep your convictions. I hope I hope we all have strong person. I got strong personal convictions about yeah. politics and and all of that. But that's not my my role as a Christian is to do what Jesus said to go and make disciples. That is the last thing he told us to do. It's not an option. It's not like if you get around to it. Mm-hmm. Jesus is like, you have now been given the goal of life, which is to go and make introduce more people to me 
to follow them, follow me together, Jesus is saying. So everything you do is a conduit for that. Whatever job and vocation you choose, whatever activities you get, like it's just a conduit for, for that to happen. So don't miss the main thing. Just don't miss the main thing. So, but to, to be the voice, to be the voice of the people listening, you know, maybe someone's listening and it's like, but where does God's truth come in? You know, yeah. there might be someone that's, you know, like, you know, pounding the, the steering wheel, listening to this in their car saying like, you know, but where is our job as ambassadors of Christ to deliver truth in this world? And so, Jason, I'm going to start with a question about how does this cancel culture affect you as a pastor? So, Jason, you have to deliver messages of God's truth to, to, to the world that's listening. And sometimes biblical truth doesn't necessarily align with what is uh, considered the status quo. Yeah. In so society. there's a huge difference though. There's a so we're gonna take a stand on biblical truth all day long. I like fiercely. I mean, dude, we've talked it's not real popular to talk about the things we've talked about at our church related to sexual ethics. Sure. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, don't um, like sex is reserved and best experience. God's plan for it is, is in the context of marriage between a husband and his wife. That's not a real popular view in today's uh, culture where there's a huge freedom of sexual expression. It's not real popular to talk about um, loving your enemies. I mean, but, but it doesn't matter. Like these are the, what it means to be a Christian. So we have no problem. When I talk about laying aside your convictions. It has nothing to do with biblical convictions. It has everything to do with your your ideological sort of personal convictions about non-biblical things, like how you think the world should work. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not going to divide the church over border wall. Yeah. You know, or divide the church over uh, whether we should drill for oil. I mean, I'm trying to think. It's like, yeah, you know, political sure. issues or whatever, right? That would be stupid. That would be, that would be irreverent. That would be, that would be horrible. I mean, like, can you imagine someone feeling like they got to have a particular position on border wall policy in order to become a Christian? Yeah. I'm telling you, that would grieve the heart of God. But and, then, yeah. Well, but, and, and, and well, let me just say that one more thing. Like yeah, in please. Acts, in Acts, which should be our starting point, because they were the first Christians trying to figure out how to be the church, and they say something in, in um, I think it's Acts 15, and they say this one little principle, we should not make it difficult for people to get to God. If you are, and so there are good reasons, there are good things that make it, I should say, that will be a challenge for people to follow Jesus, like dying to yourself, picking up your cross, like that's hard. So you may not want, you may, that's the rich young ruler. Like, I'm not ready to go there yet. But feeling like you've got to have a political ideology, that's a horrible reason. Feeling like you've got to dress the part, that's a horrible reason. Like there's, you can go down the, we can create a whole big list of like, these are not the right reasons that we, you know. And Paul said, look, I become to a Hebrew, I become like a Jew, I become like a Jew. To a Greek, I become like a Greek. Gentile, I become like a Gentile. All that I might win more people. So I'm going to talk to Democrats. I'm going to talk to Republicans. I'm going to talk to Bernie Sanders people. I'm going to talk to sure. who's the opposite. Marjorie Taylor uh, Green. Taylor Green. Yeah. I want them all. And I'll, I will do whatever I need to do to adapt to have conversations with those people. Yeah. Why? Because of the Jew become like a Jew and a Gentile become like, like mm-hmm. why? So I can win more people. I just want people to know Jesus. Yeah. And it, so much of that is posture. Ooh, so like we just, on. another, I mean, just for as long as I've been around our church, we also don't give truth without grace. And so like those two things just continue to go hand in hand and one without the other can be harmful. Mm-hmm. And so I think even the like biblical truths that you just shared, I mean, one of the things ah, we try to do is take things into conversation not just statements that have a period at the end with no more conversation or like even um, just even in our social media channels, like we try to move folks from 
online conversations to offline conversations so we can have a conversation. Mm. And so we can remember that like, hey, this person's a human. I'm a human. Like, let's just um, talk through it versus feeling like we have to keep giving one another statements with periods at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, doesn't mean that the truth would change, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we can't show up with a posture of like grace uh, understanding, hearing the other person. Love that. Um, love and that, it's Joanna. always like the thing behind the thing. And so like, I guess like you had said earlier, like sometimes you have to remember the main thing. Um, and so there's always, I don't know. I feel like, especially when some of those topics get more, um, what's the right word when you feel like you need to like defend or your flag is like stuck into the ground there's usually a thing under the thing that has caused that person or even myself to react that way. And so sometimes I think when we don't give the grace to hear more about someone's story or hear more about why they've landed those convictions or that viewpoint or that worldview, then we're like losing the ability to continue to have a valuable conversation versus just crossing our arms and saying like, Oh, well, cool. We just don't agree. I love that. I, I, I I've heard of, okay. uh, I think Andy Stanley says, some of the effect of like every every person you meet that disagrees with you has a perfectly good reason for the viewpoint they've landed. Yeah, at. that's so good. Wow. Because they have a story. Like they have, yeah. they're not stupid, and either because you don't think you're stupid. So I mean, right. like you know, they have a perfectly good. Go find it out. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to be honest too. So I'm going to put myself in in this equation. I I definitely have historically been very passionate. Yeah, about my mm-hmm. convictions and and I I definitely have found you know and you're talking it, about political yeah or political cultural, political yeah, yeah. political especially political like yeah. I've and I found my uh, echo chambers of of you know political commentary and stuff that mm-hmm. that bolster me and before I knew it I had filled my entire docket with just voices that say, agree with me and disagree with them. And after doing this for a couple years of just that, us and them, us and them, us and them, what I began to realize was everyone was my enemy. Mm. The people, other people were my enemy. Uh, it was them. And where it really came to a head is I was at a get together with some friends and I was a jerk. I'm just going to be honest. I was a jerk. The whole night I was, and they all, relatively agreed with me, but not to the fervor of what I was feeling. And and I was upset that they weren't just just as outraged. Up in arms. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, but no, you're you're not angry enough. Mm-hmm. And I walked away that night and the next morning Steph was like, you were a jerk. So what wives are great at me. Oh, and, and I was like, what do you mean? You know, and and she was like, you've got to stop. Mm. She because let me tell you, there was no Jesus. Yeah, There was no Jesus evident in, in what I was saying. And all of these things I would have argued are good things and they're convictions and they're, yeah. and, and I would vote for them. Yeah. But it was changing my heart because the, the voices had been telling me that these are my enemies. Yeah. And there are other humans. There are other children of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a good example of a conviction getting ahead of compassion. Get- conviction... Getting ahead of compassion. Cannot and get ahead of compassion. That's the way of the world. Yeah. If you're a follower of Jesus, that does that's not our way. And our that's way, where compassion I think, leads. Yeah. And that's where I think like you had mentioned the word fear earlier in one of your questions. I also think like we're afraid that like we have to um be responsible for the change or we have to yes. fight on behalf half of God. So or good. and it's like, I don't know. Sometimes I just need to remind myself that like also God's got it. Or like, and I know that that might sound really cheesy, but like ultimately like he is still in control. He doesn't really need me to go fight all of these battles on his behalf in that like righteous anger. And so like, I think some of it is like the prioritization or like the heart check of like, Ooh, why do I feel so passionate about this? Ooh, have I checked in with the Holy spirit? Like, so some of the Mm -hmm. things like that you even just described, I can definitely think of moments for that, like myself for myself, where it's like, oh, I might not be close to God in this season. Like maybe that's why the yeah. the convictions are getting ahead of the compassion. Or like you just start to ask yourself more questions. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes too in that, like 
as Christians, we just think we have to go like fight on behalf of the kingdom. And so I just think that there's like a balance there. Um, yeah. That like, I don't know, God's still in control and it like, yeah, not, he's not surprised by any of this. Nope. So, so what do you say to the person then Jace that is like, they see on Instagram, all people, the, the uh, opposite opinion, the opposite convictions, even things that are not biblical, like anti-biblical statements, mm-hmm. rhetoric online. They see this and they're like, what am I supposed to do? Am I just supposed to be silent? Like, am I am I just supposed to be muzzled? Or, or do I go and represent Christ out there in that stratosphere and that oh, risking what could be considered, you know, maybe it's not, but modern day persecution of cancellation, mm-hmm. you know, what do you say to that person or, or Joanna? Like, well, what but, do you say? But I want to clarify something real quick. I'm good with being canceled all day long for Jesus. So like, that's not the issue. I'm good with being canceled. Like, dude, he, you know, believes he took, you know, he believes that, um, that you shouldn't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something like he no, believes okay. that Jesus is the only way Right. To there, there's one right there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the Jesus, he really believes Jesus was being literal when he said, I'm the, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Nah, I can't go. There. That's, that's, that's uh closed minded. Cool. All right. Like I'm good with being, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about my opinions yeah. about how I think the, the world should work and politics should work and how school should function and all that. Right. But it's funny, even in that same statement, if someone really were to come up to you and be like, dude, do you really believe that Jesus is the only way? And you're like, yeah, I know you well enough that you'd also say, so tell me more. Yeah. Like, why is that yeah. difficult for you? Or why are you like, why? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so again, like, I just think like, we're so quick to have rhetoric without action or rhetoric without like trying to understand mm-hmm. that like, yeah. Yeah. Truth with grace. Right. We're just, yeah, quick to dig our heels in without asking more follow-up questions. That's so good, John. But I want to go back, Chad, to you You said something. And so, like, play this out. Like, you were like, but what do you do, though, if you do have personal beliefs and opinions and convictions about things that you're seeing in the culture that are yeah, that are what you would say are negative based on your... Moral convictions? Yeah, exactly. Or, like, yeah. based on your relationship with Jesus, I would say do what the Spirit leads you to do. If the Spirit's leading you to go and to be at the school board meeting and to speak up, do it. Like yeah. what you, here's what the spirit will never lead you to do. Spirit will never lead you to be, um, what's the, the, the spirit will never lead you to be mean. Yeah. <laughs> Not of God. The spirit will never lead you to lie. The spirit will never lead you to be, um, 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 antagonistic. Like I'm not talking about conviction. I'm talking mm-hmm. about, um, the spirit will never lead you to put down others at your own, to lift yourself up. Like, so as long as you're doing that with us, you know, and you're putting compassion right in the driver's seat, along next, next to the next seat over to conviction, mm-hmm. then go do it. Like, like you should, like, I think you should have an opinions and join and be active in those kinds of things. I'm just talking about like, and if people cancel you because you, that's belief, just don't let them cancel you because you're a, you're a, a jerk. A jerk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, what like, I'm getting at. Yeah, like, it's when you forget the love others piece. Yeah. It's so like we're, yeah, yeah, we are living something very similar, like even with our, in our own school. And so our kids um, are in public school. And so there's something going on right now that like our family does yep. feel like. Is wrong. Hey, we don't want to stay silent on this yeah. one, but that doesn't mean we're going to be disrespectful. You can be respectful. And right. Loving. That doesn't mean we're going to yep. show up at, to try to manipulate. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we're showing or win. up. Or win, right? Yeah. I mean, we're showing up, we're asking questions, we're trying to gain clarity. At the end of the day, I I don't even get to be a decision maker. Mm -hmm. And so we will have to live with whatever decision is made. Um, But that doesn't mean I can't go give what I think or hope the outcome should be Mm -hmm. as long as the posture is I haven't forgotten to love others along the way. Yeah. Um, That's 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 really good. good. And I see it's, it's, it's all. And that's hard. I know I just made that sound really easy. No, it's very hard. That is very difficult because of course I also want to say all of the other things that don't sound like love others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're not going to get it perfect. Yeah. If you're engaging with the world in this way, you're not going to get it perfect. It's all right. Because they also need to see Christians who will humble themselves enough to go, I messed up. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm a follower of Jesus and I should have never, and followers of Jesus don't do that. And I, and I talk to you 
and I talked behind your back in a way that I shouldn't have. Dude, that'll go a long ways. And mm. yeah. So, I mean, like, we're going to get it wrong and we're going to overset. We're going to let convictions get ahead of us sometimes and just be humble enough. Again, our humility can lead the way on some of that. I think what's, what's, what's really scary, though, and sad is when people get held accountable publicly, like the cancel culture thing, for decisions they made 25 years ago. Yeah. That's, that's, that bugs me because, uh, be, be, dude, I, well, I mean, just for me personally, like, thank God I didn't have uh, social media yeah. when I was in high school, college. Yeah. So the only difference is it just lives longer now. But, but I mean, like, I, I don't know, man. I see people who get held accountable for things they did when they were, when they were 22 years old and now they're like 51 and you're like, they were 22. And like, give them some grace. And like, they're not the same it. person. Both sides of this, this normal discussion do just that. There, it is a gotcha. Yeah. And that's not, that's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't play gotcha. No. And it's one of my favorite messages you often give is God's not out there angry trying to get you and like finally got you. His church attendance went down or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. God's not out to get you. And I think a lot of times like that's the got you culture. And and it's what scares me for my own children. So maybe there's a parent listening, Jace, or or Joanna, that's that this parent's listening and they're they're afraid for their own children to be canceled because they're gonna say something dumb. Because their frontal cortex is not formed yet in, the, in their verbal processor, and they are going to say something that's going to get them canceled. Now, maybe not on a stratospheric level like a celebrity, but but canceled in the the school they're going to get, you know, flagged in the school. So, what what do you, what do you say to that parent? That's you know, how do you teach your kid to to traverse the waters of cancel culture in this day and age? See, it's funny because I actually have a kid that I would be more worried about the opposite because he they has- They would do the canceling? He has yeah. really strong yeah. convictions already. And like- He has a high like moral threshold. Yes. My, yes. I have a child like that. Yeah. And so I actually might maybe, uh, when we were talking earlier, I was like, actually, I don't know that I'm worried about my kid getting canceled. So then even yes. hearing you say that, I think maybe now as a result of this discussion, I'm more worried that he would potentially um, be holding too tightly to his convictions. So he's got the truth um, real good. And we're working on the grace, but yeah. again, like yeah. he's seven, so we hopefully have some time. Um, you can use Marvel, like I know your son's a real Marvel fan, yeah. so you can be like, you know. I remember one time I talked to this pastor, and he said he was talking about a grace, a grace based church. Mm. Okay, he was like, you can tell when a church is really grace based. And I remember I asked him at dinner, I was like, "What's the mark? What have you found to be the consistent markers of a grace based church?" He said, grace-based churches talk oftenly about sin and its effects on our life. Now that is kind of, that was counter to what I thought. I mean, I was a, but it makes total sense. Because if you talk about sin and the devastating effect it has had between you and God, and then what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, you get great. Like you understand, you can't understand grace yeah. if there's nothing to be graced. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, you don't get it. Like it, yeah. it's it's like oh yeah, I'm forgiven. You don't really think there's anything to be given forgiven for. Here's my my point. I think is one of the ways I wonder if we help our kids not be so is just to remind them all that God Jesus Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. Because if 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 they get man, we were helpless and hopeless without Jesus. It's hard to judge someone really harshly yeah. when you realize and when you know, I deserve judging. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was so gracious to me. Like, sometimes it's like, get in tune with that and that'll soften you yeah. to the people around you. Uh, you know, something that just, this is literally just came to me is this, this idea, and this is what I want to teach my kids, is uh, there, there's three things. There, there's, there's grace and there's truth. And I want to talk to them. If if I can just teach them to love God, love others, this worldview of what does the love have me do today? What does the love of Jesus have me do today? It is going to prevent a lot of the things that would get them canceled mm -hmm. because 
The things that get us canceled are we're, when we're senseless, when we're thoughtless, when we're cruel, when we're when we don't think that anything we say has any you know ramifications. When we don't put ourselves into other people's perspectives, mm -hmm. so there's that. And then the other thing is, is back at me. So first, it's teaching them that, but maybe even before that is, what am I talking about at home? Yeah, and they will regurgitate. And if if I'm talking about talking points at home, those talking points will go to school. And they will either be destructive in the truth stage, like you said your son might be, where it's like, you know, so conviction and, you know, forget you. Or it might be destructive in the other side, where it's like, where uh, there's thoughtless statements. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, he's just regurgitating what dad said. Mm -hmm. And yet he's the one taking the the he's the one getting you know you know metaphorically beat up mm -hmm. for it. So I think I've got to teach them Jesus love and grace, but I also have to be careful of what I'm doing and what I'm teaching through my actions, and and what I'm doing with my words. Yeah, and we probably need to prepare our kids. If you follow Jesus, decide to follow Jesus with your life, you may be canceled. Yes, mm -hmm. and prepare them for that reality. Because there will be things, again, not, not we're not going to, you know, Christian can't be canceled, like it's not acceptable or maybe not whatever to, to we're not going to get canceled because we're jerks, because Christians, we're not going to live that way. You may be canceled for the ideas you have, because it's, it's going to be seen increasingly. Look, we, we, we're, we're, we live in a world and a culture that runs counter to the kingdom of God sometimes. Yeah. So that's going to put you at odds with it. Mm -hmm. Just be canceled for the right things. Yes. That, that's, I mean, that's what I would say is like, just be willing to be canceled for the right things. Well, what are the right things? Um, uh, following Jesus in the way that he calls you to follow him and yes. that will make you weird and odd. In the end, I think we could wrap by just really marching to the opinion of one. And and, and really sometimes we, we want to, if our, if we... To boil it down very simply, but it, it is also profoundly complex, is Jesus' words when he said, love God, love others. And if we just really chase the love of God and what does the love of God have me do, and yet what is my love of he other humans, what is my love for the other children that are God's, you know, if, if we really just chase that, uh, and then if we do get canceled, we still know that we have the approval and the love of our God. And I think that's something very unique and special to us as Christians, where it's like, you know, you can get, you might be at work and, and people are cruel because you don't adhere to some of their beliefs or, mm -hmm. or they, they test you constantly, mm -hmm. but you know that you have the pleasure that you are, you're pleasing your God. And I think mm -hmm. there's something that we need to take some solace in that is better to please our God mm -hmm. and not please everyone else around us. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So I would just sum it up by saying, um, hold your convictions. That's good. But don't let them outpace compassion. If you're a follower of Jesus, the reason you're a follower of Jesus is because you believe he didn't cancel you when he should have. Because of that, I'm not sure we can cancel other people. We can draw boundaries, mm -hmm. and we cannot go there but that's different than attacking them. That's good. I don't know how you can do that when that's not that's not how G, what Jesus did for you. That's so, great. wow, thank you so much, guys. I, you know, we we set out to talk about cancel culture, and uh, you both were like, I don't think I have anything to say about cancel culture. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was right. Um, so today we are so thankful for you guys tuning in and joining our conversation. As always, leave comments. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure that you uh, tune in. You know, every other Wednesday when we're dropping these podcasts. And as always, someone needs to hear what we talked about today. Make sure you you give them a shout out. Make sure you send it to them. Make sure that they get a chance to hear it as well. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's conversation, be sure to follow the show, send today's episode to a friend, and leave a review. The Live Changed podcast is produced by LCBC Church. LCBC stands for Lives Changed by Christ. 
We are one church in multiple locations across Pennsylvania. For more information about LCBC, resources from this episode, and ways to grow in your relationship with Jesus, go to lcbcchurch.com. 